I'm Mr. Loomis. Welcome back for our second lesson of this unit. I'm guessing you're watching this video on a cell phone. Can you imagine what our lives would be like if we didn't have cell phones? What if we took away the internet? Television? Radio? Even movie theaters? That was life in the Gilded Age. It was a time when people loved to read. Let's start off with a quick preview of our topics. We're going to begin with a look at two famous names in American history, Pulitzer and Hearst, and how they changed the way people learned about the world. We're going to study the Gilded Age version of clickbait, called yellow journalism. We'll be looking at a group of writers who we can truly be thankful for every time we have sausage for breakfast. We're the muckrakers. And finally, we'll take a look at the start of magazines in America. Let's get started. In a time before the internet, smartphones, television, and even radio, paper was the way Americans found out what was happening in the world. Even very small towns had at least one newspaper, and large cities had many. Many newspapers printed morning and evening editions. When breaking news happened, they made special extra editions. Hearing the newsboys on the street yelling, extra, extra, was like the alerts we get on our phones today. Magazines came in the mail, and Americans stopped at newsstands and bookstores to find things to read. In the time of reading, publishing was big business. Some of the richest Americans were publishers. The linotype machine, invented in 1883, made printing newspapers much faster. With this new technology and plenty of readers, anyone who could buy a printing press could make a newspaper. And it was during the Gilded Age that newspapers started to look like what we know today. Since most people had more time on Sundays, newspapers printed larger Sunday editions, divided into sections, just like we have today. To get more, more women to buy newspapers, fashion and beauty tips were added. And as more people watched sports for fun, a sports page was added. Dorothea Dix became the nation's first advice columnist for the New Orleans Picune in 1896. Since not everyone cared about politics and world events, Charles Dana of the New York Sun invented the human interest story. These articles told heartwarming stories about regular people like it was national news. Publishers did everything they could to get readers to buy their newspapers. And the fight for readers was hottest in New York. The two leaders of American publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. These men stopped at nothing to get people to buy their newspapers. If a news story was too boring, why not twist the facts and make it more interesting? If the truth was not interesting, why not spice it up with some fiction? If all else failed, the printer could always make the titles bigger to make a story seem more important. Older news reporters thought this was a bad idea, that it was like making up fake stories and pretending they were real. They called this new style yellow journalism. But even though some people criticized it, it was still popular during the Gilded Age because it worked to sell newspapers. Pulitzer increased the daily circulation of his newspaper, The Journal, from 20,000 to 100,000 in one year. By 1900, it had gone up to over a million. Joseph Pulitzer bought the New York World in 1883 after making the San, uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch the main newspaper in that city. Pulitzer wanted to make the New York world fun to read. He filled his paper with pictures, games, contests that drew in new readers. Crime stories filled many of the pages with headlines like, was he a suicide and screaming for mercy. Also, Pulitzer sold his newspaper for only two cents, but gave readers eight and sometimes 12 pages of information. The only other two cent paper in the city was never more than four pages long. While there were many sensational stories in the New York world, there were lots of regular news stories also. Pulitzer thought that newspapers had to make the world a better place and used it to try to uncover problems so that they could be fixed. Just two years after Pulitzer bought it, the world became the best-selling newspaper in New York. Older publishers became jealous of Pulitzer. Charles Dana, owner of the New York Sun, attacked the world and said Pulitzer was deficient in judgment and in staying power. Pulitzer impressed William Randolph Hearst, the rich publisher of the San Francisco Examiner in California. 
first read the world while studying at Harvard University and decided to make the examiner like Pulitzer's paper. Under his leadership, the examiner used 24% of its space for crime stories. Hearst added pictures on the front page. A month after Hearst took over the paper, the examiner ran this story about a hotel fire. Hungry, frantic flames. They leap madly upon the splendid pleasure palace by the Bay of Monterey, encircling, encircling Del Monte in their ravenous embrace from pinnacle to foundation. Leaping higher, higher, higher with desperate desire, running madly riotous through cornice, archway, and facade, rushing in upon the trembling guests with savage fury. Appalled and panic-stricken, the breathless fugitives gaze upon the scene of terror. The magnificent hotel and its rich adornments now a smoldering heap of ashes. The examiner sends a special train to Monterey to gather full details of this terrible disaster. Arrival of the unfortunate victims on this morning's train, a history of Hotel de Monte, the plans for rebuilding the celebrated hostelry, particulars, and supposed origin of the fire. It was a great example of the yellow press style. While the fire was surely terrible, the words used to tell the story were meant to catch the reader's attention and sell copies. Hearst sometimes went overboard. In one article about a band of murderers, he attacked the police for making the examiner reporters do their work for them. However, the examiner also added space to its paper for international news and sent reporters out to find and write about corrupt and lazy city leaders. Since so many people read newspapers, the writers had a chance to make a difference. In one well-remembered story, examiner reporter Winifred Black went to a San Francisco hospital and found out that homeless men, women were treated with gross cruelty. The entire hospital staff was fired the morning the article was printed. After he had made the San Francisco Examiner popular, Hearst bought the New York Journal in 1895. Big city newspapers started selling ads to department stores in the 1890s and found out that the stories or that the stores would pay more if they knew the newspapers would sell more copies. So Hearst set the price for his New York newspaper, the Journal, at one cent, compared to Hearst World's paper at two cents. But he still gave as much information as the other newspapers. The strategy worked, and the journal's circulation jumped to 150,000. To keep up, Pulitzer cut the price of his newspaper to a penny also. In a counterattack, Hearst raided the staff of the world in 1896. Pulitzer was a difficult man to work for, and Hearst was willing to pay more money. Many of Pulitzer's writers left to work for Hearst. Although the world and the journal were competitors, the two newspapers were similar. Both wrote stories that supported Democrats, workers, unions, and immigrants. Both new newspapers had large Sunday editions, which were like weekly magazines. The Sunday editions had the first color comic strip pages, and some historians think that the term yellow journalism started there. Hogan's Alley, a comic strip about a boy in a yellow nightshirt, nicknamed the Yellow Kid, became popular when cartoonist Richard Outcall began drawing it in the world in 1896. When Hearst hired Outcall the way, Pulitzer asked artist George Lukes to continue the strip with his characters giving the city two yellow kids. The use of yellow journalism to mean over-the-top sensationalism seems to have started with people talking about the yellow kid papers. Perhaps ironically, the Pulitzer Prize, which was started by Pulitzer, is given every year to the best news services in categories like breaking news, investigative reporting, and editorial cartoons. During the Gilded Age, Writing letters to elected leaders and hoping that they would pass laws to fix problems was slow and didn't usually make a difference. Publishing a series of articles could get the job done much quicker. Called muckrakers, a brave group of reporters uncovered and wrote about terrible problems in society. The first was Lincoln Stephens. In 1902, he published an article in McClure's magazine called Tweed Days in St. Louis. Stephen showed how city leaders used the, tax, the city's tax money to make deals with big businesses and stay in power. Stephens continued writing about corruption in city politics, and soon his articles published, were published together in a book called The Shame of the Cities. Readers were angry, and new laws were passed to clean up city government. Ida Tarbell was next. Tarbell also wrote in McClure's magazine. She called her series of articles the history of the Standard Oil Company. 
She wrote about the cutthroat business practices behind John Rockefeller's rise to power. For Tarbell, it was personal. Her own father had been driven out of business by Rockefeller. The muckrakers uncovered many problems. John Spargo's 1906, The Bitter Cry of the Children, showed how hard life was for children who had to work in coal mines. He wrote, from the cramped position the boys have to assume, most of them become more or less deformed and bent back like old men. 1905, Thomas Lawson brought the inner workings of the stock market to life in frenzied finance. David Phillips showed that 75 senators were taking money from big business in the treason of the Senate. In 1907, William Hard wrote about accidents in the steel industry in his Making Steel and Killing Men. Ray Stanner and Baker showed how African Americans were being discriminated against in Following the Color Line in 1908. Jacob Reese was an immigrant who had moved to New York and worked as a police reporter. He spent much of his time in the slums and tenements of New York's working poor. What he saw was terrible, and he wrote about the lives of the poor in his book, How the Other Half Lives. Reese was a good storyteller, using drama and photographs to tell his stories of the slums he went to. Reese was also a reformer. He thought that upper and middle class Americans could and should care about the lives of the poor. In his book, he argued against the immoral landlords and useless laws that allowed dangerous living conditions and high rents. He also said that there should be new, better tenements. Among the muckrakers was one pioneering female journalist who broke gender stereotypes of the day and became well known for her work finding corruption in business and government in New York City. Nellie Bly first became famous after convincing a judge that she was insane and being sent to the Blackwells in Island Lunatic Asylum, where she lived through the terrible treatment women there received. Her article in the New York World called Ten Days in a Madhouse made her famous and led to changes in the way the mentally ill were treated. She later traveled around the world by ship and train in just 72 days. There had been a popular book about traveling around the world, but no one had actually tried to see how fast the trip could be done. Perhaps no muckraker made as big a difference as Upton Sinclair. Sinclair hoped to show how bad life was for the workers in Chicago's meatpacking industry. His book, The Jungle, talked about workers losing their fingers and nails by working with acid, having their arms accidentally cut off, and getting sick from working in the cold. He hoped the people who read his book would get angry and laws would be passed to make the lives of workers better. What Americans were upset about was not, however, the hard lives of the workers. Sinclair had also written about the meat coming out of Chicago. Rotten meat was covered with chemicals to hide the smell. Skin, hair, stomach, ears, and nose were ground up and sold as head cheese. Rats climbed over the meat, leaving piles of excrement behind. Sinclair said he had hoped to hit America's heart, but hit his stomach instead. Even President Roosevelt, who had come up with the name Muckraker, took action. In just a few short months, Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act and Meat Inspection Act to clean up the country's food supply. Because of Sinclair's book, today, the Food and Drug Administration keeps an eye on the country's food and medications to protect us from the problems Sinclair found. Along with newspapers and books, magazines gave Americans news, information, and entertainment during the Gilded Age. Weekly magazines like Puck, Couture's, Collier's, and the Saturday Evening Post became popular during the Gilded Age. They were normally about 32 pages long, and had a full color cover, sometimes of a political cartoon. Inside were articles about politics, fashion, human interest stories, humor, pictures, letters, and poetry. They also published novels one chapter at a time. In this way, McClure's published such writers as Arthur Conan Doyle, Rudyard Kipling, Jack London, Robert Louis Stevenson, Ray Bradbury, Agatha Christie, William Faulkner, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Edgar Allan Poe, and Mark Twain. Some of America's most famous novels were first printed one chapter at a time in the magazines of the Gilded Age. As we already mentioned, magazines included the work of some of the most famous muckrakers. Weekly magazines such as Puck McClure's, Collier's, and the Saturday Evening Post were popular for nearly half a century until the 1950s, when Americans turned to a new form of entertainment, television. At the end of this story, I think it's so interesting to find out about where some of the things we know today, like magazines and newspapers, came from. I hope you find it interesting as well.
Before we close out, let's recap our big ideas. Before the internet, radio, or television, most people got their news from newspapers and magazines. Two great publishers, Pulitzer and Hearst, competed for subscribers and developed a style of sensational journalism that exaggerated the truth and used flashy headlines to catch potential readers' attention. And this was called yellow journalism. Muckrakers showed the wrongs of city life, the meatpacking industry, robber baron practices, and government corruption. Some of their work led directly to changes in laws that made America better. Next time, we'll be talking about a group of people we call the progressives who also have had a long-term impact on us. Next time you go to the YMCA or drop off donations at the Salvation Army or visit a national park, you can thank them. I'll see you next time when we find out what they were all about.